Humanity has been obsessed with the concept of eternal life since, well, basically forever. But it's not just the immortality of vampires that fascinates us, it's also their capacity to observe humanity from a distance while it made technological advancements or went to wars. Vampires can live up and down in society and even parallel and sideways. We know Bram Stoker's Dracula, Marvel's Morbius and Blade, but not enough attention or love is given to the female vampires. There have been several amazing female vampires throughout pop culture history, each more unique than the last, and it's only prudent that we explore these beauties and throw some light upon them, just not sunlight. So without further ado, let's explore the 20 best female vampires from movies. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. <laughs> Miriam Blaylock, The Hunger. 1983. Miriam Blaylock is the main villain from The Hunger, a film that's pretty much a feast for the eyes as it is an exploration of the immortal dilemmas of love, aging, and the quest for eternal youth. Played by Catherine Deneuve, Miriam has been around since ancient Egypt, making her one of the OGs of the vampire world. This lady has a taste for the finer things in life, seducing lovers with the sweet promise of forever youth. But there's a catch. While you get to hang around for eternity, you're doing so in the fast lane to look like your own grandpa. Miriam's story gets rather interesting when her latest beau, John, a cellist from the 18th century with a wardrobe as timeless as his love for Miriam, starts aging faster than the speed of light. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, more like a ripe banana in the sun, but anyway, the film directed by Tony Scott is a visual masterpiece that doesn't shy away from the nitty gritty of what it means to love when you're an eternal being with a slightly questionable moral compass. Miriam had layers, like an onion or a really expensive cake. Sure, she might use her lovers for a bit of immortal company, but she's not cold hearted. She's got this tender romantic side that comes through in her relationships, especially with John and later Sarah, played by Susan Sarandon. It's complicated with Miriam. She's just as much about the seduction and the promise of eternal life as she is about the genuine connections she forms with her partners. So I think she's rather gray as far as her morality and ethics are concerned. Marie, Innocent Blood, 1992. Marie, brought to life by Anne Parlo in Innocent Blood, isn't your typical vampire. This lady has a code. She's a bit of a Robin Hood type, but instead of stealing from the rich, she feeds on the bad guys and, well, who are we to judge? Everyone has their own sense of justice, and you can think of her as the knight's own vigilante who picks up members of the Italian mafia to quench her thirst. She's meticulous too. After her meal, she makes sure her dinner doesn't wake up craving blood smoothies, so she takes them out for good with a bullet to sever the spine. Like most vampire stories with female leads, her life changes when she bites off more than she can chew with mob boss Marcelli. A slip up in her usual cleanup routine turns him into a vampire, which sparks a mess she hadn't bargained for. Then comes in Joseph Gennaro, an undercover cop. Together, they're a match made in, well, definitely not heaven, but they're pretty darn effective at trying to put the undead Marcelli back in the ground. After the dust settles and Marcelli is dealt with, Marie experiences a good old existential crisis. Overwhelmed by the fallout of her actions, she contemplates ending it all under the harsh glow of the sunrise. Yet, love has a funny way of throwing a wrench in the works. Gennaro, smitten and determined, pulls her back from the brink and offers her a chance at a new start and makes her feel alive again for the first time in ages. Ernessa Block, The Moth Diaries 2011. Ernessa Block, played by Lily Cole in The Moth Diaries, was another unique vampiress, someone like that new kid who transforms everything and everyone around them. An all-girls boarding school is already a breeding ground for secrets and whispers, and it gets a dose of the mysterious with Ernessa's arrival. She has this uh, sort of enigma and a cloud of mystery about her, which makes her both intriguing and a tad unnerving. From the very beginning, Ernessa's mere presence brings all sorts of trouble, especially when it comes to Rebecca, our lead, who is already wrestling with her own demons of loss and Agree. Ernessa, with her ghostly aura, becomes the personification of the darkness Rebecca is trying to evade. But Rebecca starts piecing together a theory that Ernessa might be dealing with more than just teenage angst. Rebecca quite rightly figures that Ernessa might be a vampire preying on Lucy, who is the best friend of Rebecca. Ernessa's character is the one that's filled with seduction and mystery, which kind of resembles the classic vampire story Carmilla. Through her, the film explores the themes of isolation, paranoia, and the overwhelming tide of grief that can drown the best of us. Eve, only lovers left alive. Eve is the kind of vampire who's been there, done that, and still manages to keep her cool with an air of elegance only Tilda Swinton could bring to the screen. This lady is centuries old wisdom wrapped in a cloak of modern charm with a love for life's finer pleasures, be it art, 
literature, or music. Despite roaming the earth for hundreds of years, she didn't even turn into a cynical old bat. She rather became a connoisseur of human creativity. Living apart from her husband, Adam, Eve has set up shop in the vibrant alleys of Morocco. But these two are what the younger generation calls couple goals. They're bound not by time or place, but by an immortal love. When she senses Adam sinking into a pit of despair back in his Victorian home in Michigan, she doesn't hesitate to catch the next night flight out. Because that's what you do when your eternal soulmate is feeling blue. You show up. Eve is like a breath of fresh air in Adam's gloomy world. She urges Adam to snap out of his funk and appreciate the beauty still lurking in the shadows of humanity's mess. But just when you think Eve has it all under control, we meet Ava, Eve's younger sister, who brings chaos into the mix like only a reckless vampire can. While Eve sips on ethically sourced O negative, Ava's out there living her best life with zero regard for the rules. Through Eve, only lovers left alive gives us a vampire who goes beyond the bloodlust and instead houses an insatiable lust for life's myriad experiences. Valerie Sharp, Dracula 2000. Valerie, played by nerd icon Jerry Ryan, is your quintessential TV news reporter turned vampire vixen. She was out there, mic in hand, hoping to catch the golden hour glow for the gram, er, I mean for the evening news. Like any reporter worth her salt, she wanted that perfect shot, insisting her cameraman, JT, capture her best angles, sunset and all. But then, Dracula himself decides to photobomb her live broadcast. Before she knows it, Valerie is embroiled in all things horror. She tries to escape and even locks herself in the van, only to watch her cameraman meet his doom on the live feed. Dracula tears through the van like it's made of paper, and with a mix of charm and supernatural mojo, he seduces Valerie right then and there. Next thing you know, she was sporting the vampire look, complete with a bite mark, of course. As one of Dracula's brides, alongside Solina and Lucy, Valerie forgot all about her reporting duties and dedicated herself to protecting her man, even if it meant taking down Van Helsing himself. After her transformation, her personality does a 180. The once friendly and professional Valerie turns into a cold-hearted protector of Dracula, ready to fight with anyone who crosses her path. She even gets a bit flirty with Simon during a fight, but all good things and bad vampires must come to an end. Valerie meets her death courtesy of a wooden stake to the chest, courtesy of Simon. Claudia, Interview with a Vampire, 1994. Claudia's story is more of a gothic playbook, but of course there's a dash of weird that hits you right in the feels. Imagine being stuck forever in a five-year-old's body, but with a mind that's seen over six decades of night. It sounds kind of like lion -O from Thundercats had a major vampiric experience. That's Claudia for you, a vampire child with the appearance of an angel, but the wisdom and wrath of someone much older. Her story begins with Louis finding her clinging to life amidst a plague outbreak. Starving and desperate, he feeds on her, only for Lestat to swoop in. Claudia is then whisked away from the brink of death, not to salvation, but to a never-ending night as a vampire, courtesy of Lestat's dark gift. Living with Louis and Lestat, she grows a serious grudge against Lestat for locking her into eternal childhood. Her frustration boils over when she realizes she'll never grow up or change. Filled with spite and smarts, she comes up with her own version of a solution, but it was kinda dark because she wanted to use poisoned young boys. But like any plan where immortals are a player, things got messy. Selene Underworld series. Underworld, directed by Len Wiseman and written by Daniel McBride, is this dark gothic action film from 2003 that totally blew us away. It stars Kate Beckinsale as Selene, a vampire assassin or death dealer caught in an ancient feud between vampires and werewolves, aka lichens. However, Selene's life gets super complicated when she falls for Michael, a human destined to become a vampire werewolf super hybrid. Born in 1383 to Hungarian parents, she was turned into a vampire by Elder Victor, who killed her family, but this wasn't known to her. Years later, she became the first vampire Corvinus strain hybrid. Michael, her love interest, is the original hybrid, and together they have a daughter, Eve. Now, Selene is something of a new vampire elder who steers the vampire ship alongside David and Lena. Personality-wise, she is tough, serious, and about as warm as a freezer. Smiling and laughing aren't really her thing. She's all about business, she doesn't put up with nonsense, and she's fiercely independent. However, despite her tough exterior, she's got a soft spot for those she cares about and goes into full revenge mode if they're threatened. She avoids human blood and tries to keep bystanders out of her battles, which shows that she's got a moral compass under all that leather and latex. Celine's journey from a cold-hearted warrior to someone more human, thanks to her connection with Michael, really makes her a special kind of vampire. Someone who absolutely deserves to be in this video, and maybe even top of the list. Plus, her iconic all-black outfit became an instant hit, so there's that as well. <laughs> Rebirth 
Regine Dandridge, Fright Night Part 2, 1988. Slipping into Charlie's world with a vendetta thicker than blood, Regine Dandridge wanted to avenge her brother's death by turning Charlie, a vampire hunter, into one of the undead. A seductress with a master plan, she led a loyal team of nightcrawlers, but that doesn't mean she ever lacked charm. From the beginning, Regine haunted Charlie's life by weaving herself into his dreams with seduction, a lot of it. However, Charlie's old pal, Peter Vincent, smells something fishy, or rather bloody, but Charlie's therapy sessions have him doubting his own vampire hunting past. Regine crashes Charlie's date night, and leaves him with a love bite that starts his own slow burn into vampire territory. On the other hand, her minions were sent on a mission to corner Charlie's team, particularly his girlfriend Alex. As far as Regine's personality is concerned, she was into the finer arts of seduction, sadism, and a very obnoxious sense of care. She toys with Charlie like a cat with a mouse, and doesn't forget mixing tender care with her torment. Despite her vengeance-fueled agenda, there's this bizarre kind of intimacy, something that feels romantic and motherly at the same time, and that's just confusing as well as creepy. Hello, Clara. Clara Webb, Byzantium. 2012. Clara from Byzantium is a vamp mom, and that's not something you see every day, right? Born into hardship in Hastings and thrown into a life no one would envy, she turns her fate around in the most badass way imaginable, yeah, by becoming a vampire. But like many of the entries on this list, Clara is not a typical vampire who kills to live and lives to kill. She's a survivor, a protector, and a rebel with a cause. In the beginning, she was picked up from a beach, forced into a brothel where she lived a life that was focused solely on survival. But as you may have figured out, she wasn't really a damsel in distress. When life gave her lemons, she made bloody lemonade. Now that she was immortal, she shot her way to freedom and into the eternal night. A couple of centuries later, Clara was still playing the game of shadows with her daughter Eleanor by her side. They were on the run and constantly dodging vampire brotherhoods by blending into the background of a seaside town, but this town was also where it all started. Clara is fiercely protective of Eleanor and is willing to do whatever it takes to keep her safe, even if it means turning a hotel into a makeshift brothel. Her relationship with Eleanor is the heart of the story. It revolves around love, secrets, and the unspoken tension that comes with being immortal. Nadja, Blood Red Sky, 2021. Nadja from Netflix's Blood Red Sky was stuck on a plane with her kid when hijackers did their thing and she had no choice but to unleash her inner Dracula to save the day. A mom first and a vampire second, an accidental action hero when things get going tough, Nadja is all of those things and more. Her vampire story doesn't start with the usual bite at a glamorous ball, but in a battle for survival during a snowstorm road trip gone wrong. Nadja, her husband Nikolai, and their baby boy Elias found themselves in trouble when their car went cold in the middle of nowhere. With Nikolai going MIA while seeking help, Nadja steps up, baby in tow, braving the snow like a boss. Stumbling upon an old farmhouse that screams, enter at your own risk, she finds more than she bargained for. A blood trail, obviously her husband out of the picture because of a vampire with a serious attitude problem. After a fight that pits the new mom against a bloodthirsty monster, she manages to survive until sunrise, thanks to some quick thinking and a basement door. But victory comes with a price as she finds a bite mark on her hand. In the movie, Nadja tries to prove the old vampire wrong, fighting tooth and nail literally to control the beast within for the sake of her son and the passengers. Despite her best efforts, the film closes on a note that echoes the old vampire's warning. The curse is too strong to tame. Carmilla Karnstein, The Vampire Lovers, 1970. The Vampire Lovers is a classic slice of 1970s hammer horror, no cap. We don't know about you, but uh, we kind of love this film, simply because it was one of the most fresh ideas back in the day. It all starts in the 18th century with this stunning vampire girl in a misty graveyard. She tries to go fang to fang with vampire hunter Baron Hartog, but ends up losing her head instead. In 1790, this mysterious lady ditches her daughter, Marcia, at General von Spielsdorf's Styrian home. Marcia, who's really Carmilla in disguise, gets kinda chummy with the general's niece, Laura. But things take a dark turn when Laura starts having these strange and horrifying nightmares and suddenly dies. Carmilla, on the other hand, vanishes right after. Next, Carmilla crashes at Mr. Morton's place. She wins over Morton's daughter, Emma, but her vampire instincts kick in and Emma starts showing signs of Carmilla's nightly visits. Emma's governess falls under Carmilla's spell too, turning into her helper in crime. Despite some in the house getting suspicious and even dying mysteriously, Carmilla's spree continues unchecked. Things escalate when Carmilla, after killing the butler and duping him about the governess, 
tries to whisk Emma away, but her plan is foiled when a young man named Carl steps in with a makeshift cross. Carmilla escapes back to her ancestral ruins. Just in the nick of time, General von Spielsdorf shows up with Baron Hartog. They track down Carmilla's resting place, and despite Emma's distant protests, they end Carmilla's undead escapades with a stake to the heart and a beheading. And, for the grand finale, Carmilla's portrait turns from beauty to beast, revealing her true nature. Nina Harker, Bram Stoker's Dracula, 1992. Mina Harker, originally Mina Murray in Bram Stoker's Dracula, is a fascinating character who is the personification of Victorian restraint and deep transformative passion. When we first meet Mina, she's the portrait of a proper, somewhat repressed young woman of her time who dabbles in mild rebellion by peeking at risque literature. But this fair maiden's life falls apart and into the extraordinary when she crosses paths with Count Dracula, a centuries-old vampire who sees in Mina the reincarnation of his lost love, Elisabetta. Dracula's arrival ignites a dormant fire within Mina. She's drawn to him with an intensity that's as much about the allure of the forbidden as it is about the echoes of a past life. Her journey from a reserved fiancé to a woman torn between her love for Jonathan Harker and the dark magnetic pull of Dracula is quite contrasting to say the least. Mina's struggle is palpable. She's caught in a web of desire, loyalty, and fate. Dracula's bite and the sharing blood bring them closer which creates a telepathic connection. However, you should note that this connection was both a blessing and a curse. It's through this bond that Mina starts remembering her past as Elisabetta, which further complicates her feelings. I mean, following this, she starts to get increasingly torn between the two men. Despite the dilemma and the tempest raging in her heart, Mina's love for Dracula doesn't cloud her sense of right and wrong. In the chapel, where Dracula renounced his fate, she offers him peace through death. Marishka Van Helsing, 2004 Marishka from Van Helsing was one of Dracula's trio of troublemakers and a character who knew exactly how to make an entrance and an exit. From the get-go, Marishka found herself embroiled in all sorts of action. She begins by hunting down Frankenstein's monster with her vamp sisters. Their intent was to use the monster to kickstart their vampire baby-making machine. But when Dracula kills Victor Frankenstein and the monster bolts, their dreams go up in smoke literally, as a mob torches the place. Quite clearly, Marishka was never just a one-trick pony, though. She had this thirst for drama. And blood, obviously. When she and the party decide to attack a village for a little midnight stack, she was more than a willing participant. Then Verona, her fellow bride, dares her to take down Gabriel Van Helsing, and Marishka's just like, hold my beer, or her glass of blood, I guess? She swoops in bat-style, but ends up eating it when Van Helsing's arrows come to greet her. But the arrows do little to slow her down, and she shakes them off, ready to mock Van Helsing, but his sidekick, Carl, was already on the move with some holy water. Too bad for them, Verona manages to destroy that bottle by throwing it into a well. However, Carl points Helsing to a holy water fountain. Marishka goes full bat out of hell at him, only to get outplayed. Van Helsing, armed with his new holy water-powered bow, turns her into a flying skeleton that crashes onto a rooftop. You're done. Rose the Hat, Dr. Sleep 2019. Rose the Hat was the main villain in Doctor Sleep, the sequel to The Shining. Played by Lady Jessica, I mean Rebecca Ferguson, Rose was the leader of the True Knot, a gang of psychic vampires living off the shine of children. These folks are the nightmare fuel that keeps you up at night, with Rose leading the charge in her hauntingly stylish way. So what's the deal with Rose? Well, she has this persona that's part rock star, part sinister seductress, all wrapped up with a signature hat that's kind of her trademark. Rose hails from Ireland and originally went by the name Rose O'Hara. Quite obviously, she carries centuries of mystery with her. Despite her youthful appearance, she's been around the block more times than she'd care to admit, thanks to her diet of psychic energy. Rose is basically the cream of the vampire crop. She's got powers that range from astral projection to mind reading, which makes her quite the formidable foe. But even with all her tricks, she meets her match in Abra Stone, a girl with psychic abilities that put Rose's to shame. This doesn't sit well with Rose, who sees Abra as the ultimate prize in her quest for immortality. Danny Torrance from the first film, now all grown up and struggling with his own demons, gets tangled up in Rose's plans when he becomes a mentor to Abra. Rose's pursuit of Abra sets off a chain of events that forces Danny to confront his past and the ghosts that have haunted him since his childhood at the Overlook Hotel. <sighs> The Girl, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, 2014. This Iranian film opens in a huge wasteland only known as Bad City. The multitudes of oil drilling machines let out a sense that Bad City is on its way to becoming a ghost town. In this setup lives a hard-working but unfortunate teenager named Arash, 
who is not just lonely, but also has to take care of his heroin addict father, who owes money to a drug dealer and a pimp named Saeed. To make ends meet, Arash works as a gardener for a wealthy family. But when Saeed seizes his car as repayment for his father's loan, Arash resorts to stealing. When he goes to meet Saeed to give the diamonds in return for his car, he finds that Saeed has been brutally murdered. Arash takes his car along with the bags full of drugs and cash, and he goes to a club to sell his drugs only to later meet a girl. Unbeknownst to Arash, the girl is a vampire who saved the poor and oppressed women and children of Bad City by slaying the oppressors. As Arash and the girl start to develop feelings for each other, they find themselves at a psychological crossroads. Anna Lily Amirpour's film asks what happens when a good girl obsessed with killing bad guys meets a good guy. Does she love him, or does she find a new perspective to look at things? This ultra-modern vampire love story was shot in stylishly expressionistic black and white with slow direction. It certainly gives a different view and interpretation of the vampire genre that's always been the bread and butter of teens and action horror lovers. Akasha, Queen of the Dam. 2002. Akasha, the first ever vampire according to the movie and the main villain in Queen of the Damned, had supermassive grand plans to dominate Earth and reign supreme over all vampires. She's awakened by Lestat de Lioncourt, who's drawn to her despite warnings from his mentor Marius about her overwhelming power. Years later, Lestat had become a rock star, which put him back on Akasha's radar. She makes what you may call a dramatic entrance at a London vampire club, where she learns some vampires wanted Lestat gone from blowing their cover. Unbothered by all of this petty vampire politics, Akasha makes a show of it by dancing, you know, seductively, before literally tearing a vampire's heart out and reducing others to dust. After this, she goes on to finish her performance by torching the place, cause why not? Akasha later arrives at Lestat's Death Valley concert and saves him from an attack before luring him to her lair, which was, of course, surrounded by her victims. She seduces Lestat into becoming her partner in crime, and the two of them end up feeding off each other. However, the party is spoiled when Jessie Reeves, her aunt Maharet, an ancient vampire, and others confront them. They're appalled at Lestat's submission to Akasha. Akasha dismisses the ancient's peaceful coexistence ideals and commands Lestat to kill Jessie. In a twist, Lestat drinks from Jessie but uses the moment to break free from Akasha's influence. He tries to end Akasha by draining her blood, but she resists. The ancients step in to weaken her further until Maharet sacrifices herself to drain Akasha completely. Now, this turns her first to bronze, then to dust, effectively ending her reign of terror. In the movie, Akasha is depicted as a void of selfishness and nihilism devoid of any moral compass or empathy. She is essentially someone who constantly tries to fill a deep inner void. However, what makes her the true monster is her refusal to see, let alone accept, her own monstrous nature. Let's see if you taste as good as your brother. Santa Nico Pandemonium from Dusk Till Dawn, 1996. Santa Nico Pandemonium, originally Esmeralda, was born a Dampier in 1894. As fate would have it, she found herself caught between human and vampire worlds. Raised by her dad, Mauricio, who tried and failed to keep her human, her life was far from easy and was marked by abuse and attempts on her life. So it's safe to say that Esmeralda had anything but a regular childhood. But then you can't really expect that if you're a Dampier, or basically the children of a human and a vampire. By 1913, when she was just 19, she was starting her first major turning point. She saw one Johnny Madrid's near execution by her father and ended up whisked away by Madrid after he escaped. They soon crossed paths with American author Ambrose Bierce and a newlywed couple, which led her to La Tedla del Diablo, and it was here she reconnected with her vampire heritage and learned that she was Quixla and Mauricio's daughter, destined to become a vampire princess. Her transformation completed after she kills her grandmother and turned her father into a vampire. However, despite her attempts to hold on to Johnny, he ultimately left her. So, Santa Nico Pandemonium lived like this for quite a while and became a force to reckon with. In the year 1996, she was known in the vampire community as the feared and seductive vampire queen of the Titty Twister who used her allure as an exotic dancer to entrap and feed on patrons. Interestingly, she even had herself a slave named Seth, though Seth later killed her, so that was a shitty thing that happened to her. As Esmeralda, she was gentle and kind-hearted, but as Santa Nico, she was super cold and merciless, naturally. She viewed humans as nothing more than food or second-grade life forms. Vampirella 
Vampirella 1996. So we personally believe that the 1996 film Vampirella is an absolute hidden gem. I mean, how often do you see a vampirist from a comic book splashed onto the screens like that? So of course, we gotta thank Jim Wynorski and the creative mind of Forrest J. Ackerman for Vampirella. She belongs to a universe where vampires hail from a planet named Draculon, where they spend their free time swimming in rivers of synthetic blood. It sounds crazy, but it gets crazier. No vampire story is truly complete without Dracula or some version of him. So here as well, we've got Vlad, played by the surprisingly perfect Roger Daltrey. As you may have guessed, he's not just any vampire, he's an ancient alien vampire who's ditched the planet of Blood Rivers for Earth. Once on the planet, he reinvents himself as Jamie Blood, a rock star with questionable fashion choices. So what does Vlad want? Well, the usual stuff, to turn Earth into a vampire paradise by blotting out the sun. Now, on the flip side, we have Ella, or as she's known on Earth, Vampirella. She's the stepdaughter of Draculon's high elder, who Vlad betrayed and killed. Burning with revenge, Vampirella chases Vlad to Earth, only to take a slight detour via Mars and a few millennia of cryosleep. Now, back on Earth and all geared up, she's ready to take Vlad down once and for all. Eventually, Vampirella ends up teaming with a special police unit tasked with nabbing extraterrestrial threats. Our vamp heroine goes from vengeance seeker to humanity's unlikely protector, battling Vlad and his vampire mob in Vegas of all places. Despite her vow against drinking blood, she's thrown into a moral dilemma to save humanity. Interestingly, Vampirella has also appeared in a crossover story with aliens. You know, those biomechanical monsters ready to kill anything that moves. In fact, she even leads to the creation of a flying xenomorph queen with vampiric powers. Let us know if you want us to explore that story, because it's kind of a corker and a little tough to find. Rain. Blood Rain 2005. Rain was the fierce Dampier protagonist of Blood Rain a movie that borrows its premise from a video game. Rain was born from the union of a vampire and a human. Naturally, she's immune to the usual vampire kryptonites like crucifixes and without the typical vampire bloodlust for humans. Hers is essentially a story of a vendetta against her dad, Kagan the Vampire King. Why? Well, he was the monster who raped her mother before taking her life, which is what set Rain on a path of revenge. Rain's journey started with an escape from carnival captivity. Needless to say, she was all about vengeance, but she also had a heroic streak where she would save families from vampire attackers, etc. A fortune teller lets her in on Kagan's evil plans and also tells her about a talisman that could get her close to Kagan. Rain's mission is to grab this talisman from a monastery, but it turns into a magical moment when she absorbs an ancient eyeball talisman, which immediately grants her immunity to holy water. But of course, the girl was beyond collecting magical vampire relics. Rain teams up with the Brimstone Society, a team dedicated to the vampire cause, though not without internal conflicts. As should be expected, betrayals and battles ensue, with Rain showing off her fighting skills, especially when retrieving another talisman from water-filled caves. The climax has Rain facing off against Kagan in his castle by tricking him with an empty box instead of the heart talisman. Despite the loss of her allies, Sebastian and Vladimir, Rain's determination sees her through. She uses her wits and strength to finally defeat Kagan, thereby successfully avenging her mother and ending his reign of terror. Rain's story wraps with her taking a moment on Kagan's throne before setting off to the mountains. So yes, she was very well a dampier, but her heritage didn't define her even in the least. In the end, it was all about what she did instead of who she was. <laughs> Isabella, I Like Bats, 1986. I Like Bats is a film that dives deep into the life of a not-so-typical vampire with a heart. And fangs, of course. And this vampire was looking for a tad bit more than just her next meal. But you know, sometimes a gal vampire could just be a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. So she falls for Rudolph, a handsome psychiatrist with a knack for treating the mentally ill, not realizing his latest patient is vampirically challenged. Naturally, this patient would need more than the usual meds. Instead of lurking in the shadows, Isabella was quite out there trying to get a handle on her, let's say, unique dietary preferences through therapy. Amazingly enough, she had this whole darkly comedic aura around her, and she knew how to balance her nighttime hobbies with a blooming crush on her shrink. And here we are, with our work-life balance at stake. Our girl was witty, a bit on the lonely side, and cooler than the other side of the pillow. She impressively managed her way through the murky waters of vampire romance while still trying to figure out if she could swap out bloodsucking for true love. That's all for this time, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.